Hey everybody, Darren Voros here. Today I'm here with Stephanie Yates, a mortgage broker based out of the Toronto area. And we're going to be talking about why your interest rate on your mortgage is not the most important thing. Before we get into it with Stephanie, if you haven't done so already, you can subscribe to my channel, hit that notification bell, and feel free to leave comments and questions below for me. I love getting your comments and your questions. And without further ado, let's do this. Stephanie, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to join us. I know that the mortgage world and the mortgage broker and agent world right now is going crazy. So I know you're uh, incredibly busy. And so thanks for taking some time out of your day to join me. Uh, before we get into it, uh, give everyone a bit of an intro on who you are and what you do. Sure. So, um, and also it's not month end. So fortunately we've got a little bit more time than usual. <laughs> Um, so yeah, my name is Steph and I've been a mortgage broker for uh, close to 11 and a half years. I started brokering to pay my way through university, through my master's, and uh, got my teaching degree and never stepped into a school. I have a lot of experience in both A and B lending, uh, and I work with a lot of Keyspire investors, which is how we met. Yeah, excellent. And I know that there's um, this, this question that always comes up for uh, investors, and that is, as an educator, somebody that's been in this space for a little while, I'm always pressing people to work with mortgage agents and brokers who are specifically gearing their business towards working with investors. And um, why is that an advantage from your perspective with somebody who specializes um, uh, with, you know, working with investors? Great question. So the first reason is that with a mortgage broker, we've got access to 30 or 40 different lenders. So there's what they call a lending, which is what most people are familiar with the big banks, monoline lenders, um, generally best rates as well. There's also B lending, which allows for a little bit more creative processing. Often it's at an exchange for a slightly higher interest rate. There are generally fees that are included in your closing costs. Um, but it allows you to expand your portfolio and acquire more property than you would if you just stuck with a lending or a bank. Um, so generally speaking, finding and working with a good broker, so not any broker, but a good broker, uh, would really allow you to grow your portfolio more than if you were to just have a relationship with one specific lender. Well, and, and expand on that a little bit, because another question that I get often is, you know, can we be putting our information out to multiple brokers? And tell me what the pitfalls of that could be if you're working with, uh, you know, kind of shopping your, your mortgage around to different people. And that's a, a common problem. And it's a frequent conversation that I have with people um, when we first meet on the phone or in person, I'll have a conversation with them. Have you spoken with any other brokers? If so, why do you not feel comfortable being loyal to them or even trust their competency? Where is the disconnect that you're speaking with somebody else? The issue with uh, dealing with more than one broker could be that you are providing conflicting information or each broker has their own way of sort of packaging your application and submitting it to a lender. It's less of a problem when you're, you know, a first time home buyer, salary, great credit, squeaky clean. Generally speaking, yes, that's something that most people can accomplish quite easily. But if you're looking for a little bit more finesse or an experience outside of that, then you should be working with one specific broker who can accumulate your application, submit a consistent message to all lenders, and fairly shop all lenders for rates uh, and different strategies based on your discussion with them. And, and something that I was taught early that that's really helped me is, you know, start thinking about your next mortgage almost on, on your current application, right? So it's, I think people get a little bit short-sighted on, I just need to get this one property financed and figured out. Whereas a good, you know, investor focused broker or agent will really say, well, what is the end goal here? Do you want to have 10 properties? Mm -hmm. Then we need to set up your first five mortgages this way in order to be able to grow the portfolio. That's my favorite question to ask. <laughs> Literally within five minutes on the phone with people, I'll say, okay, so tell me what's, what's your goal. If I handed you a magic wand and I said, what is your one year, five year, 10 year plan? What are you hoping to accomplish? Is this the first, even with first time home buyers who don't even have the concept of investing yet, they just want that first home. I'll ask them, is this going to eventually become a rental? So we can pull the equity out by another. Do you plan to sell this? What's your, you know, game plan? And Nine times out of 10, especially with first-time home buyers, they'll say, I hadn't really thought about it. And you should. And the reason you should is because when you're focusing on rate, and a lot of times when you see like rate hub and all these with these low promo rates, they're not apples to apples and not all products are the same. So if you have a goal of eventually refinancing your current property, 
and you're within that five-year window of, let's say you have a five-year term, you want to know you're working with a lender who either has a HELOC program, a home equity line of credit program, so that you can leave your first mortgage as it is, avoid any penalties, and withdraw your equity in what some prefer for a tax strategy perspective from a line of credit, or a lender who will let you do compartments with under one charge, meaning you can have your current mortgage stay exactly as it is and take out another section that they fix that payment. There's tons of different scenarios, but not every lender offers that. And so with mono line lenders who only offer mortgage products, so MCAP or RMG, for example, they often offer better rates, but they don't offer a lot of flexibility. Hmm. So that's why strategy is so important in knowing which lender to place you with. And that should be the focus over what the rate is. What is the danger of, of sort of shopping on the internet versus reality when it comes to getting a mortgage? Another great question. And honestly, it's, it's setting up your own expectations. The number one priority you should have as an investor is finding a broker that fits with you, that you trust, that you're comfortable with their competency, and that they understand what you're looking to accomplish. Once all those things are met, if your broker comes to you and says, hey, here is the product that I feel is the best fit for you. This is the product that you qualify for. Here's the rate. Here's the terms. If you have an issue with the rate, there's never a harm in having that conversation. But you also have to be open to the education piece, which is, you know, on Rate Hub, often you'll see a five-year insurable low rate basic. Do you know that as a consumer? Probably not. But your broker would understand and they'd say, well, you're not insured, meaning you have a 30-year amortization, not a 25-year amortization. Mm -hmm. A low rate basic means that there's a much higher penalty. Often it's 3% of the principal. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if you do break it prior to the five-year term, which statistically most people do, Mm -hmm. you're subject to a much higher penalty and would offset any rate savings you would have by utilizing that product. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people insist on those rates and Brokers have to make the decision. Do I want to keep this client who is insisting on this rate? Or do I put them in a product that I feel as the professional is the best course of action? And so the right broker will have that frank conversation with you. Um, But it's important to know going into that, that there is more behind the scenes than just a standard mortgage. They're not all cut from the same cloth. So what should people be watching out for beyond the interest rate of their mortgage? Number one is finding a lender that's going to be a good fit. If you're owner-occupied, rental, first-time home buyer, 10th property, it's important to build a relationship with your broker who will then foster a relationship with your lender. And the reason I put broker in front of lender is because I've seen examples where I've got a majority of a client's portfolio with Scotia because they're willing to give specific exemptions and, you know, it's a good fit overall. And then an application comes up where they're not willing to play ball. Great. That's the broker's job then to facilitate a switch in strategy. Now we're going to drive business to TD or B2B or a different lender that you may or may not have even heard of, but has a great promo product or just had a change in rules where now you fit. So the focus should be building a relationship, understanding what your long-term goals are, and then making sure that you're with the lender that can help get you there through a broker who understands your plan. How would you look at somebody in that situation that may not qualify Uh, with the A lenders, how do you keep growing their portfolio from there? So there's A lending and then there's B lending. And to your point, a lot of people are not aware that B lending even exists or, or what it's made up of. And so they're legitimate financial institutions, not to be confused with private lending, which can be independent investors. Um, And they allow for extended ratios, better offsets. They are very forgiving of self-employed income. Um, But To their point, the higher the risk for them in allowing these exceptions, the higher the rate. And so if you're looking to build your portfolio out and you've maxed out A lending as much as you can, you've stretched it as far as you possibly can, the next step is B lending, um, which again, slightly higher rate, but at what exchange? Now you have another property in your portfolio that is cash flowing and the difference of 50 basis points, not even a whole percent, could be the difference in you getting a property that's now appreciating at astronomical rates in the GTA. What are some of those fees and what do they look like when when working with a 
B lender, not only from the lender side, but there are some broker fees as well, because a lot of times you as the broker in an A lender situation are getting paid by the bank. And sometimes in a B lender situation, you're not. So you're going to be charging for your time to your clients. So, so give us a breakdown of how that works. So yeah, on A side, we get paid, generally speaking, by the bank. Um, there are times that there's options to leverage commission for rates. Um, on the B side, generally speaking, there is a one to one and a half percent fee, depending on the lender and depending on the rate. So a B lender ultimately wants the same return. They want a specific ROI, return on their investment. If you want a lower rate, sometimes that comes at a cost of a higher fee, but effectively you're going to be paying the same amount across the board. Mm -hmm. um, B lending often is a lot more work for a broker. Um, and because it's not option through a traditional bank, you can only do it exclusively through a broker. So oftentimes, yeah, broker fees are charged. Depending on the broker, they can be anywhere from a half of, uh, of a percentage all the way up to 2%. Um, I've had clients who have come to me at the 11th hour. They were in private lending at 9%, and I was able to get them into a B lender at 3%. I can tell off the bat what the cost savings will be. I know that I had to drop everything to facilitate this file. And so out of respect for our time, we sort of charge accordingly. Um, but assuming it's you know part of the plan and relatively cookie cutter, some people charge no broker fee at all and some up to 2% in addition to the lender generally charging one to 2% of the mortgage amount, not the purchase price. What is sort of the optimal situation you want to put your clients in is it that mortgage with the home equity line attached to it is that sort of like first and foremost mm -hmm. or is there a situation where you don't recommend that for your clients it all comes down to strategy for example some lenders will report on the credit bureau and some won't um, and for some clients that matters in their long-term strategy some clients some lenders are really flexible and rental property friendly some are not so I take a look at the overall big picture, but I feel like my job as a broker is number one, first and foremost, to get you the most cost effective money. Does that mean rate is everything? No. Does that mean cost effective? It's 1.65 or 1.7? No. The difference to me is, am I looking A or B? First, I want to try to facilitate A if I can. And then on top of that, the next step would be which lender is going to be the best fit for them for this specific property based on the rate, based on prepayment options, based on portability and bells and whistles. And then from there, I narrow down which lender I think is the best fit. Let's talk about some, some myths because I think there are many in the mortgage world. Um, mm -hmm. and I'd like to go through a few of them and get your perspective. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, let's talk about this one first. You can only ever, you can only ever have five mortgages. Uh, you can only oh. have five properties and mortgages in your false. portfolio. False, 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 false. <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely not the case. I've heard that one. I've heard three, I've heard five, I've heard six. Uh, no, that's not the case. It depends Where does that on come from though? I think because there is some legitimacy to that yeah. point in that most of the major financial institutions in Canada, let's say the big six banks, will tap people out at about five or six mortgages in their personal name. Is that correct? Yeah. Generally speaking, from a risk perspective, um, most of the big five, big six will cap them at five or six, depending on the lender. Some of them will make exceptions based on clients' overall application. If you have high liquid, liquid being the keyword, net worth, um, mm -hmm. so not just equity, um, even RSPs that are involved in syndicates or second aren't considered liquid, don't count towards your net worth. Mm -hmm. um, little tips and tricks like that, again, are an important distinction, but most will cap at five or six, but they'll allow them to then go commercial. So generally speaking, there's always a yes, but, um, and the but is how else can you make it happen? All right, second um, myth is that um, we can only amortize uh, up to, let's say, 25 years on a mortgage? So if you're insured, meaning you're putting less than 20% down, then yes, your max amortization is 25 years. If you're putting 20% down or more, you can go up to 30 years. Um, sometimes there are better rate options, though, if you stick with a 25-year AM. So there's you know something to consider there. And most private lenders will easily do, if not interest only, a 40-year amortization. What about... Um... Variable rate, uh, fixed rate is better than variable rate. I hear that often. What's your what's your thought on those two choices when it comes to, uh, and maybe explain a little bit of the difference between, some people might not even know the difference. I didn't know before I got my first mortgage. 
I went in and I was like a 25 year old kid and they were like, do you want a fixed rate or a variable rate? And I was like, I don't know what this person just said to me. So, um, You're probably like the lowest they, rate. Yeah, I was like, whatever. Um, yeah. Maybe explain a bit the difference in the two and, and give us your perspective on those two right now. Right. And it's funny you say that because um, I've made a point of almost every mortgage I've ever uh, obtained for myself, I've actually done through a broker. And the reason I've done that is because I've wanted to experience being a client because I started brokering before I ever owned a home and I knew, you know, customer service mattered, but I wanted to see what it felt like to be on the receiving end of that. And I remember the first broker that did my mortgage didn't even give me the option. I just Hmm. got a commitment and, you know, I was expected to sign it. There was no conversation, no education. Uh, And so you at 25, it's surprisingly common with most people, even older second or third home, they don't always know Hmm. again, because they just ask for the lowest rate. Yeah. Um, but a variable rate is based on prime. So your lender will offer you prime plus or prime minus. So right now prime is at 2.45 and most lenders are offering in and around prime minus 90 or prime minus 95. So you're at about 1.5. Mm. Fixed right now, for example, Scotia's five year is around 2.44. That's a pretty big spread. Um, mm. Normally the difference between the two isn't quite as vast as it is now, but um, And so traditionally, I'm more of an advocate for fixed. I like that there is a set monthly payment. Um, I think statistically, variable is typically favorable because when you break your mortgage, a variable will result in a lesser penalty than a fixed, again, Mm -hmm. depending on where you are in the term. Mm -hmm. Um, But variable also is interesting because when prime goes up or if prime goes down, your rate then fluctuates based on your prime plus or your prime minus. Mm -hmm. Some lenders keep you on the same amortization schedule. What does that mean? So essentially, if you start your mortgage off as a 30-year amortization with a five-year term, your principal and interest is set so that you will have your mortgage paid off in 30 years. If prime goes up, for example, some lenders will opt that your payment becomes more interest to offset the increase and less principal, which then changes your amortization schedule. Other lenders will change your payment so that it keeps you on the same amortization schedule. I hear often that real estate investors specifically should only be going into fixed term mortgages because the bank prefers those because they are set and they're not going to fluctuate based on the industry. Has that been your experience as a, as a broker with, with working with investors? The only example I can think of that that is so cut and dry is with a line of credit. So a line of credit is always going to be variable and it's generally prime plus either one or 1.5 or 0.5. And a common misconception is that, well, I only pay interest only. So my payments on a line of credit are much lower than a fixed, even if the rate's a little bit higher. Um, But on your application, if you have a line of credit, we have to calculate your payment based on the current stress test rate of 479 and a 25 year amortization. So effectively, the payment we have to use is much higher than if you amortized Mm. it. So I haven't really experienced lenders having an issue with your like primary mortgage being variable or fixed, but certainly a line of credit, which is exclusively variable, can definitely have a negative impact on your application. So what is your best piece of advice, Stephanie, for people that are looking to get into real estate investing and they're just focused on that rate right now because they're seeing those crazy low interest rates? What is your best piece of advice for those uh, individuals or those people when they come to you and, and are looking to get a mortgage? To allow yourself to see more than just the rate. Your primary focus should always be finding a broker that fits. And I appreciate that that's coming from a broker. <laughs> so <laughs> it may be a slight conflict of interest there. But if you're working with a competent, confident, educated broker who takes the time to explain the differences to you, who takes the time to understand where you're trying to go, then at some point it's a matter of letting them do their best work. And if it comes back that it's not quite what you were expecting, Make sure that you're comfortable to have that conversation, but also listen to them describing the differences between the products and why there are slight rate differences. At the end of the day, of course, rate is certainly a factor. It's, you know, an important factor. But if a project for you is make or break based on 0.5% or 0.05%, maybe that's not the best product project for you to be considering on top of that. So There's more to it than just rate, there's product type, there's structuring, there's long-term strategies, there's relationships, uh, and it doesn't do you a service as someone who doesn't understand the inner workings to shop it around and not ask those questions to compare 
apples to apples instead of apples to oranges and mangoes and kiwis and bananas. Uh, Stephanie, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day you. to, to go through those questions with me. If you guys enjoyed this session with Stephanie, go ahead and hit the like button below. You can also subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, and feel free to leave comments and questions below for both Stephanie and myself. Uh, I hate to do this, but put down, put in the comment section below what rate you're currently paying on your mortgage so you, can, <laughs> so you can brag to everyone on my YouTube channel what, what interest rate you're getting. Uh, we'll see who has and the lowest also rate. Also be sure to include if you're insured, uninsured, uninsured rental. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You have to put all the other things in there, not just yeah, the your rate. Your credit score. No, don't do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you can also follow me on Facebook, Instagram, or check out my website at darrenboros.com. With that, I'll say, Stephanie, thanks so much for being here with me today. I appreciate you taking some time out of your busy day. I wish Thank you the you best so of success on your real estate investing journey, and I look forward to ch uh, chatting with you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Stephanie.